Hello. This is I. I'm going to be reading. Start up a new song. Crap, this is a very long chapter for some particular reason. Host of the pitch from Gimlet, where real entrepreneurs pitch to real investors. I'm gonna wait for this ad. Recently, a founder is nailing the pitch for his blockchain startup until an investor says, Do you know someone named Fluffy Pony? <laughs> I definitely do not. Oh, I hate to say Pony. this, but he just started a company that is exactly like this. Find out what happens next in episode 50 of The Pitch. Tap now to listen on I should on probably Spotify. just go ahead and invest in premium. What's better than something awesome? Lots of awesome things, all wrapped up in one awesome package. With Spotify Premium, you get all sorts of awesome features. Unlimited skips, on-demand we'll play, how offline mode, far I need to audio read. quality, connection to almost every device, and I think last time I counted music. something around Tap the banner to learn more. a lot. That is the end of chapter 15. So all the way to here. So that is a thick portion right here. Let's get reading. Nigerian, uh, I gotta start with the top. Chapter 15, cultural transformations, religion and science. 1450 through 1750. Nigerian pastor Daniel Ajaya Adaram is a missionary in the United States with his mission field in the Bronx. The church he represents is Redeemed Christian Church of God, began in Nigeria in 1952. It has acquired millions of members in Nigeria and boasts a missionary network with a presence in a hundred countries. According to its leader, the church was made in heaven assembled in Nigeria, exported to the world, and the redeemed church of God is not alone. A secularism, secularism and materialism born of scientific revolution and modern life have eroded religious faith in the West. Many believers in Asia, Africa, and Latin America have felt called to revigorate declining Christianity in Europe and North America. In a remarkable reversal of the earlier pattern, they now seek to re-evangelize the West, from which they originally received the faith. After all, more than 60% of the world's professing Christians now live outside Europe and North America, and within the United States, one in six Catholic dis theosin. Can somebody look up that word? If not priest, and one in three cemetery seminary students are foreign-born. For example, hundreds of Filipino priests, nuns, and lay workers now serve churches in the West. We could just throw up our hands and see these churches turned into nightclubs or mosques, declared Tukombo, yeah, another Nigerian church leader, seeking to minister to an increasingly godless West. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit on the book. Starting right here. The early modern era of the world history gave birth to two intersecting cultural trends that continue to play out in the 21st century. The first was the spread of Christianity to Asians, Africans, and Native Americans, some of whom now seem to be returning the favor. The second was the emergence of a modern scientific outlook which sharply challenged Western Christianity, even as, as it, too, acquired a global presence. Starting here. And so, alongside new empires and new patterns of commerce, the early modern centuries also witnessed novel cultural transformations that likewise connect to distant peoples. Riding the currents of European empire building and commercial expansion, Christian Christianity was established solidly, solid, solidly in the Americas and the Philippines, far more modestly in Siberia, China, Japan, and India, and hardly at all within the vast and still-growing domains of Islam. 
A cultural tradition largely limited to Europe in 1500 now became a genuine world religion, spawning a multitude of cultural encounters. While this ancient faith was spreading, a new understanding of the universe and a new approach to knowledge were taking shape among European thinkers of the scientific revolution, giving rise to another kind of cultural encounter that between science and religion still goes on to this day. Where was I? Science was a new and competing worldview, and for some it became almost a new religion. In time, it grew into a defining future, feature of global modernity, achieving a worldwide acceptance that exceeded that of Christianity or any other religious tradition. Although Europeans were several players in the globalization of Christianity and the emergence of modern science, they did not act alone in the cultural transformations of the early modern era. Asians, Africans, and Native Americans largely determined how Christianity would be accepted, rejected, or transformed as it entered new cultural environments. Science emerged within an international and not simply a European context, and it met varying receptions of different parts of the world. Islam continued a long pattern of religious expansion and renewal, even as Christianity began to compete with it as a world religion. Buddhism maintained its hold in much of East Asia, as did Hinduism in South Asia and numerous smaller scale religious traditions in Africa. And Europeans themselves were certainly affected by that many new worlds that they now encountered. The cultural interactions of the early modern era in short, did not take place on a one-way street. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and read this section and we'll see how long the next blue one is. Because I forgot my water, so I'm going to have to go back and get that. Starting here, and I'm going to end here, and start here after I get my water. Despite its Middle East origins and its earlier present in many parts of the Afro-Eurasian world, Christianity was largely limited, or excuse me, Afro-Asian world. Christianity was largely limited to Europe at the beginning of the early modern era. In 1500, the world of Christendom stretched from Spain and England in the west to Russia in the east, with small and beleaguered, beleaguered, I think that's it, communities of various kinds in Egypt, Ethiopia, southern India, and Central Asia. Internationally, the Christian world was seriously divided between the Roman Catholics of the Western and Central Europe and the Eastern Orthodox of Eastern Europe and Russia. Externally, it was very much on the defense against an expanse of Islam. Muslims had ousted Christian crusaders from their tree toeholds in the Holy Land by 1300, and with the Ottoman seizure of Constantinople in 1453, they had captured the prestigious capital of Eastern Orthodoxy. The Ottoman siege of Vienna in 1529 marked a Muslim advance into the heart of Central Europe, except in Spain and Sicily, which had recently been reclaimed for Christendom after centuries of Muslim rule. The future, it must have seemed, lay with Islam rather than Christianity. Alright, I'm gonna go get a water real quick. I will be right back. Uh, t can somebody tell me if the music is, is too loud because I can turn it down if I need to.
Okay, I'm back. I'm going to start here. Western Christendom fragmented. The Protestant Reformation. Protestant, excuse me. As if these were not troubles enough, in the early 16th century, the Protestant Reformation shattered the unity of Roman Catholic Christianity, which for the previous 1,000 years had provided the cultural and organizational foundation of an emerging Western European civilization. The Reformation began in 1517 when a German priest, Martin Luther, hey, publicly invited debate about various abuses within the Roman Catholic Church by issuing a document known as the 95 Thesis, the, is it thesis? thesis, allegedly nailing it to the door of a church in Wittenberg. The original Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King or King Jr. I've heard about this too, but I never knew what he actually did. It's pretty interesting. In itself, this was nothing new, for many people were critical of the luxurious life of the popes, the corruption and mortality of some clergy, the church's selling of indulgences said to remove the penalties for sin and other aspects of church life and practices. What made Martin Lu what made Luther's pro protest potentially revolutionary, however, was its theological basis. A troubled and broading man anxious about his relationship with God, Luther had recently come to a new understanding of salvation. He believed that it came through faith alone. Neither the good works of the sinners nor the sacraments of the church had any bearing on the eternal destiny of the soul, for faith was a free gift of God, graciously granted to his needy and undeserving people. To Luther, the source of these beliefs, and of religious authority in general, was not the teaching of the church, but the Bible alone, interpreted according to the individual's conscience. Conscience? Conscience. Conscience. I don't know how you spell conscience, so I'm going to assume it's conscience. All of this challenged the authority of the church and called it question the special position of the clerical hierarchy and of the pope in particular. In 16th century Europe, this was the stuff of revolution. Contrary to Luther's original intentions, his ideas provoked a massive schism within the world of Catholic Christendom for they came to express a variety of political, economic, and social tensions as well as religious differences. Some kings and princes, many of whom had long disputed the political authority of the Pope, found in these ideas of justification for their own independence and an opportunity to gain the lands and taxes previously held by the Church. In the Protestant idea that all vocations were of equal merit, middle-class urban dwellers found a new religious legitimacy for their growing role in society, since the Roman Catholic Church was associated in their eyes with the rural and feudal world of arist aristocratic privilege. For common people who were offended by the corruption and luxurious living of some bishops, abbots, and popes, their new religious ideas served to express their opposition to the entire social order, particularly in a series of German peasant revolts in the 1520s. Although large numbers of women were attracted to Protestantism, Protestantism, Reformation teachings and practices did not offer them to substantially greater role in the church or society. In Pro Protestant-dominated areas, the veneration of Mary and female saints ended, leaving the male Christ figure as the sole male Christ figure as the sole object of worship. Protestant opposition to celibacy and monastic life closed the convents. I don't know what I just read. Which had offered some women an alternative to marriage, nor were Protestants, except the Quakers, any more willing than Catholics to offer women an official role within their churches. The importance that Protestants gave to reading the Bible for oneself stimulated education and literacy for women. But given the emphasis on women as wives and mothers subject to male supervision, they had little opportunity to use that education outside the family. Reformation thinking spread quickly both within and beyond Germany. Thanks in large measure to the recent invention of the printing press, 
Luther's many pamphlets and his translation of the New Testament into German were soon widely available. God had appointed me the printing press to preach, whose voice the Pope is never able to stop, declared one Reformation leader. As the movement spread to France, Switzerland, England, and elsewhere, it also splintered amoeba-like into a variety of competing Protestant churches, Lutheran, Calvinist, Calvinists, Anglican, Quaker, and a Baptist, many of which subsequently subdivided, producing a bewel bewildering array of Protestant dominations. Each of was distinctive, but none gave allegiance to Rome or the Pope. I wish they made this more... I mean, I know it's supposed to be AP, but like... These are hard words to say. And like... Try to read. <laughs> Starting here. Thus, to the sharp class divisions and the fractured political system of Europe was now added to the potent brew of religious difference operating both within and between the states. For more than 30 years, French society was torn by violence between Catholics and the Protestant minority known as Huguenots. Huguenot. I'm just going to say Huguenot. On a single day, August 24th, 1572, Catholic mobs in Paris massacred some 3,000 Huguenots, and thousands more perished in provoke prov provincial towns in the we I'm so bad at reading. In the weeks that followed, finally, a war-weary monarch, Henry IV, issued the Edict of Nantes in 19 1598, granting a substantial measure of religious tolerance to French Protestants though was the intention that they would soon return to the Catholic Church. The culmination of European religious conflict took shape in the Thirty Years' War, 1618 through 1648, a Catholic Protestant struggle that began in the Holy Roman Empire but eventually engulfed most of Europe. It was a horrendously destructive war, during which scholars estimated between 15 and 30 percent of the German population perished from violence, famine, or disease. Finally, the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, brought the conflict to an end, with some reshuffling of boundaries and an agreement that each state was sovereign, authorized to control religious affairs within its own territory. Whatever religious unity Catholic Europe had once enjoyed was now permanently splintered. The Protestant breakaway, combined with reformist tendencies with the Catholic Church itself, provoked a Catholic Reformation, or Counter-Reformation. In the Council of Trent, 1545 through 1563, Catholics clarified or reaffirming their unique doctrines and practices, such as the authority of the Pope, priestly celibacy, the veneration of saints and relics, and the importance of church tradition and good works, all of which Protestants had rejected. Moreover, they set boundaries. Ah, oh, lost my place. <laughs> boundaries they didn't even say moreover they set about correcting the abuses of and corruption that had stimulated the protestant movement by placing a new emphasis on the education of priests and their supervision by bishops a crackdown on descendants included the censorship of books fines exile penitence and occasionally the burning of heretics Renewed attention was given to individual spirituality and personal piety. piety. The New religious orders, such as the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, provided a dedicated brotherhood of priests committed to the renewal of the Catholic Church and its extension abroad. Although the Reformation was profoundly religious, it encouraged a skeptical attitude towards authority and tradition. For it had, after all, successfully challenged the immense prestige and power of the Pope and the established Church. Protestant reformers fostered religious individualism, as people were now encouraged to read and interpret the scriptures for themselves and to seek salvation without the mediation of the Church. In the centuries that followed, some people turned that sc skepticism and the habit of thinking independently against a conventional religion. Thus, the Protestant Reformation opened some new space 
some space for new directions in European intellectual life. In short, it was a more highly fragmented but also a renewed and revitalized Christianity that established itself around the world in several centuries after 1500. On to the next section. Let me see how long this one is. It's not long at all. So I'm going to take a very short break right now. Like, I'm just going to, like, right here. Okay, I'm back. Alright. I'm gonna get started on this next section. Actually, I'm just gonna leave the book. I'm gonna move the light a little bit closer. I don't want this to be, like, maybe... Uh, there we go. Nope. I'll auto-adjust. That should be fine for now until I fix it. Christianity motivated European political and economic expansion and also benefited from it. The result, result, resolutely Catholic Spanish and Portuguese both viewed their movement overseas as a continuation of a long crusading tradition, which only recently had completed the liberation of their countries from Muslim control. When Vasco da Gama's small fleet landed in India in 1498, local authorities understandably asked, What brought you hither? They replied, They had come in search of Christians and of spices. Likewise, Columbian, Columbus, upon arriving in the Americas, expressed the no doubt sincere hope that the people might become Christians, even as he promised his Spanish patrons an abundance of harvest of gold, spice, cotton, aloe wood, and slaves. Neither man sensed any contradiction of hip hypocrisy in this blending of religious and material concerns. If religion drove and justified European ventures abroad, it is difficult to imagine the, colonis the globalization of Christianity without the support of empire. Of empire. Just stop there. <clears throat> Colonial settlers and traders, of course, brought their faith with them and sought to replicate it in the newly discovered and conquered homelands. New England Puritans, for example, planted a distinctive Protestant version of Christianity in North America, with an infinite emphasis on education, moral purity, personal conversion, civic responsibility, and little tolerance to competing expressions of the face. Faith. Enter the Rocket Mortgage Super Bowl Square sweepstakes. We're giving away fifty thousand dollars every. Actually, I'm just gonna turn my headset off for that. That was pretty dumb because I lost where I was. Rocket Mortgage, official mortgage sponsor of Super Bowl Fifty Four. No purchase necessary. Except Alabama, Nebraska, and Mississippi, ends January 30th. License North America. States, NLS number 3030. The NFL is not sponsored promotion in any way. They did not show much in interest in converting native people, but sought rather to push them out of their ancestral territories. It was missionaries, mostly mostly Catholic, who actively spread the Christian message beyond European communities. Organized in missionary orders such as the Dominicans, Franciscans, and Jusits. Portuguese missionaries took the lead in Africa and Asia, 
while Spanish and French missionaries were most prominent in the Americas. Missionaries of the Russian Orthodox Church likewise accompanied the expansion of the Russian Empire across Siberia, where priests and monks ministered to Russian settlers and trappers, who often donated their first sable furs to a church or monastery. <laughs> Maybe I can turn the music up now. Missionaries had their greatest success in, <coughs> in Spanish America and in the Philippines, areas that shared two critical elements beyond their colonization by Spain. Most important, perhaps, was an overwhelming European presence experienced variously as military conquest, colonial settlements, missionary activity, forced labor, social disruption, and disease. Surely it must have seemed as if the old gods had been bested and that any possible future lay with the powerful religion of the European invaders. A second common factor was the absence of a literate world religion in these two religions. Regions. Throughout the modern era, people's solidity rooted in Confucian, Buddhist, Hindu, or Islamic tradition proved far more resistant to the Christian message than those who practice more localized, small-scale, orally based religions. That's the end of this section right here. I'm gonna move on to this one. Let me see how long it is. Oh, look, the Last Supper. Wouldn't take that long. I move this whole thing over to the left. How does that look? It looks, I think it looks better. There we go. Alright, I'm going to take a few sips of water real quick. Alright, Spanish America and Chinese illustrate the difference between the societies in which Christianity became widely practiced and those that largely rejected it. Both cases, however, represent major cultural encounters of a kind that was becoming more frequent as European expansion brought the Christian faith to distant peoples with very different cultural traditions. The decisive conquest of the Aztec and Inca empires and all that followed from it, disease, population collapse, loss of land to Europeans, forced labor, resettlement into more compact villages, created a setting in which the religion of the victors took held in Spanish American colonies. Europeans saw their political and military success as a demonstration of the power of the Christian God. Native American people generally agreed, and by 1700s, <clears throat> by 1700 or earlier, the vast majority had been baptized and saw themselves in some respects as Christians. After all, other conquerors such as the Aztecs and the Incas had always imposed their gods in some fashion on defeated peoples, so it made sense, both practically and spiritually, to affiliate with the Europeans' god, saints, rites, and rituals. Many millions accepted baptism, contributed to the construction of village churches, attended services, and embraced images of saints. Despite the prominence of the Virgin Mary as a religious figure across Latin America, the cost of conversion was high, especially for women. Many women, who had long served as priests, shamans, or spiritual ritual specialists, had no corresponding role in the Catholic Church, led by an all-male clergy, and with a few exceptions, convent life, which had provided some outlet for female authority and education in Catholic Europe was reserved largely for Spanish women in the Americas.
Alright, where was I? Give me a second. right here I'm pretty sure earlier conquerors hold on let me make sure yeah I was right here earlier conquerors had made no attempt to eradicate local deities and religious practices the flexibility and, cl and inclusiveness of Mesoamerica and Andean religious had made it possible for the subject people to accommodate the gods of their new rulers while maintaining their own traditions but Europeans were different they claimed an inclusive religion, exclusive religion, truth, and sought the utter destruction of local gods and everything associated with them. Operating within a Spanish colonial regime that actively encouraged conversion, missionaries often proceeded by persuasion and patient teaching. At times, though, their frustration with the persistence of idolatry, superstition, and error boiled over into violent campaigns designed to uproot old religions once and for all. In 1535, the Bishop of Mexico proudly claimed that he had destroyed 500 pagan shrines and 220,000 idols. During the 17th and early 18th centuries, church authorities in the Andean region periodically launched movements of extirpation designed to fatally undermine native religions. They destroyed religious images and ritual objects, publicly urinated on native idols, desecrated the remains of ancestors, flogged idolaters, and held religious trails and processions, procession, processions of shame, aimed at humiliating, humiliating offenders. I can't talk. It is hardly surprising that such aggressive action generated resistance. Writing around 1600, the native Peruvian nobleman, Guaman Poma de Island, commented on the pos posture of native women toward Christianity. They do not confess, they do not attend catechism classes, nor do they go to mass, and resuming their ancient customs and idolatry, they do not want to serve God or the crown. Occasionally, overt resistance erupted. One such example was the religious revivalist movement in central Peru in the 1560s known as Taku Ancua, dancing sickness, possessed by the spirits of local gods or huacas. Traveling dancers and teachers predicted that an alliance of Andean deities would soon overcome the Christian god the intruding Europeans with the same diseases that they had brought to the Americas and restore the world of the Andes to an imagined earlier harmony. They called on native peoples to cut off all contact with the Spanish, to reject Christian worship, and to return, return to traditional practices. The word had turned about, one member declared, and this time God and the Spaniards will be defeated and all the Spaniards killed and their cities drowned, and the sea will rise and overwhelm them, so that there will remain no memory of them. <clears throat> this really kind of puts strain on your throat, just for some reason. I wonder why. Gonna check. 
how much I had left. Wow. I have this much left, and I've already read that much. It's not bad. Alright. More common than such frontal attacks on Christianity, which colonial authorities quish, quickly smashed, were efforts at blending two religious traditions, reinterpreting Christian practices within an Andean framework and incorporating local elements into an emerging Andean Christianity. Even fem female dancers in the Taki Onkoi movement sometimes took the names of Christian saints, seeking to appropriate for themselves the religious power of Christian figures. Within Andean Christianity, communities, women might offer the blood of a llama to strengthen a village church or make a cloth covering for the Virgin Mary and a shirt for an image of a hawk. With the same material, although the state cults of it, the Inca faded away, missionary attacks did not succeed in eliminating the influence of local huacas. Images and holy sites might be destroyed, but the souls of the huacas remained, and the representatives gained prestige. One Brazilian Andean resident inquired of a Jusu missionary, Father, are you tired of taking our idols away from us? Take away that mountain if you can, since that is the god I worship. In Mexico as well, an immigrant Christianity was assimilated into patterns of local culture. Parishes were organized largely around pre-colonial towns or regions. <clears throat> Churches built on or near the sites of old temples became the focus of, of community identity. Cofradias? Church-based associations of lay people organized community processions and festivals and made provisions for proper funerals and burials for their members. Central to an aging, emerging cri Mexican Christianity were the saints who closely paralleled the functions of pre-colonial gods. <coughs> pre-colonial gods. Saints were imagined as parents of the local community and the true owners of its land, and their images were paraded through the streets on the occasion of great feasts and were collected by individual household. Mexico's virgin of Guadalupe, Guadalupe, I think that's the right term, neatly combined both Mesoamerican and Spanish notions of divine motherhood. Although parish priests were almost always Spanish, the fiscal or leader of the church staff was a native Christian of great local prestige who carried on the traditions and roles of earlier religious specialists. Throughout the colonial period and beyond, many Mexican Christians also took part in rituals <coughs> derived from the past with little sense of income compatibility with Christian practice, incantations to various gods for good fortune in hunting, farming, or healing, sacrifices of self-bleeding, offerings to the sun, divination, the use of hallucinogenic drugs, all of these practices provided spiritual assistance in those areas of everyday life not directly addressed by Christian rites. Conversely, these practices also showed signs of Christian influence. Wax candles, normally used in Christian services, might now appear in front of a stone image of a pre-colonial god. The anger of the neglected saint, rather than that of a traditional god, might explain someone's illness and require offerings, celebration, or a new covering to regain his or her favor. In such ways did Christianity take root in the new cultural environments of Spanish America, but it was a distinctly Andean or a Mexican Christianity, not merely a copy of the Spanish version. Whoa. I did not understand a single word I just read. Hey y'all, I'm Maddie, and something I love about the Chick-fil-A Nuggets is their gold color. It lets me know that I'm about to enjoy something I think I'll get through this whole delicious. thing tonight. There's so many for their testimonial. blue sections. Am I still in the first red one? On the app by 31st, oh, let me check. 
Want to hear something amazing? Discover matches all the cash back you earn at the end of your first year automatically. I'm still in the first for red no section. What the heck? Earn. Amazing. It's kind of like being showered with There's cash the from second above, red. Which would also be pretty amazing. It's so amazing that millions of people a Third year are red. getting their cash back match. They just can't get enough. So whether it's raining down on your head or raining into your bank account, it's your cash back. And Discover is matching it. Discover cash back match. What are you waiting for? Learn more at Looks like there's only three reds, and I'm still in the first one. Alright, I'm back. I had to get my dog sorted out. Alright. Last one until the next red section. I can do this. I can do this all tonight if I wanted to. Let's get this done. The Chinese encounter with uh, an Asian comparison. China and the Jesuits. The Chinese encounter with Christianity was very different from that of Native Americans in Spain's New World Empire. The most obvious difference was a political context. The peoples of Spanish America had been defeated, their societies thoroughly disrupted, and their cultural confidence sorely shaken. China, on the other hand, encountered European Christianity between the 16th and 18th centuries during the powerful and prosperous Ming and Qing dynasties. Is it Queen or just King? Or Ting? Or however you say the Q. Alright. Although the transition between these two dynasties occasioned several decades of internal conflict and at no point was China's political independence or cultural integrity threatened by the handful of European missionaries and traders working there. The reality of a strong, independent, confident China required a different mission strategy, for Europeans needed the permission of Chinese authorities to operate in the country, whereas Spanish missionaries working in a colonial setting sought primarily to convert the masses, the leading missionary order in China. The Jesuits took deliberate aim at the official Chinese elite, following the example of their most famous missionary, Mateo Rico. China 1582 through 1610. Many Jesuits who learned Chinese became thoroughly acquainted with classical Confucian texts and dressed like Chinese scholars. Initially, they downplayed their mission to convert and instead emphasized the interest in exchanging ideas and learning from China's ancient culture. A highly educated men, the Jesuits carry the recent secular knowledge of Europe, science, technology, geography, map making to an audience of curious Chinese scholars and presenting Chinese teaching. Jesuits were at, pain, were at pains to be respectful of Chinese culture, pointing out parallels between Confucianism and Christianity rather than portraying it as something new or foreign. They chose to define Christian rituals honoring the emperor or venerating ancestors as secular or civil observances rather than as religious practices that had been abandoned. Such efforts to accommodate Chinese culture contrast sharply with the frontal attacks on Native American religions in the Spanish Empire undertaken by many missionaries. <coughs> the religious and cultural outcomes of the missionary enterprise likewise differed greatly in the two regions. Nothing approaching mass conversion to Christianity took place in China as it had in Latin America. During the 16th and 17th centuries, a modest number of Chinese scholars and officials did become Christians, attracted by the personal lives of the missionaries, by their interest in Western science, and by the moral certainty that Christianity offered. Jesuit missionaries found favor for a time at the Chinese imperial court, where their mathematical, astronomical, technological, and map-making skills rendered them useful. For more than a century, they were appointed to head the Chinese Bureau of Astronomy. Among ordinary people, Christianity spread very modestly amid tales of miracles attributed to the Christian God, while missionary teachings about... My bad. 
I accidentally hit the mic. About eternal life sounded to some like Taoist prescriptions for immortality. At most, though, <coughs> missionary efforts over the course of some 250 years, 1550 to 1800, resulted in 200,000 to 300,000 converts, a minuscule number in the Chinese population approaching 300 million by 1800. What explains the very limited acceptance of Christianity in modern China? Fundamentally, the missionaries offered little that the Chinese really wanted. Confucianism for the elites of Buddhism, Taoism, and multitude of Chinese gods and spirits at the local level adequately supplied the spiritual needs of most Chinese. Furthermore, it became increasingly clear that Christianity was an all-or-nothing faith that required converts to abandon much of the traditional Chinese culture. Christian monogramy, for example, seemed to require Chinese men to put away their concubines. What would happen to those deserted women? By the 18th century, the early 18th century, the papacy and competing missionary orders came to oppose the Jesuit policy of accommodation. The Pope claimed authority over Chinese Christians and declared that sacrifices to Confucius and the veneration of ancestors were idolatry and thus forbidden to Christians. The Pope's pronouncements represented an unacceptable challenge to the authority of the Emperor and an affront to Chinese culture. In 1715, an outraged Emperor Kangxi wrote, I asked myself how these uncultivated Westerners dare to speak of the great percepts <coughs> of China. Their doctrine is of the same kind of little heresies of the Buddhist and Taoist monks. These are the greatest absurdities that have ever been seen. As from now, I forbid the Westerners to spread their doctrine in China that will spare us a lot of trouble. This represented a major turning point in the relationship of Christian missionaries and Chinese society. Many were subsequently expelled, and missionaries lost favor at court. In other ways as well, missionaries played into the hands of the Chinese opponents. Their willingness to work under the Manchurian Qing Dynasty, which came to power in 1644, discredited them with those Chinese scholars who viewed the Qing as uncivilized foreigners and their rule in China as disgraceful and illegitimate. illegitimate. Missionaries' re reputation as miracle workers further damaged their standing as men of science and rationality, for elite Chinese often regarded miracles and supernatural religion and superstitions fit only for the uneducated masses. Some viewed the Christian ritual of Holy Communion as a kind of cannibalism. Others came to see missionaries as potential subversive for various Christian groups met in secret. Such religious sects had often provided the basis for peasant rebellion, nor did it escape China notice that European Christians had, overta had taken over the Philippines that their worships were active in the Indian Ocean. Perhaps the missionaries, with their great interest in maps, were spies for the aggressive foreigners. All of this contributed to the general failure of Christianity to secure a prominent presence in China. Now before I get to this next section, I'm going to take a break. Uh, I'll be back.
any music playing? Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's playing. You won't believe what my dog did to my pencil. Just did that. Like, I left it on my bed. He just chewed it up. You know that, Bo? You chewed up my pencil. Okay. Now to start reading the next section. Although Europeans were persistence in change in Afro-Eurasian cultural traditions, although Europeans and central players were central players in the globalization of Christianity, theirs were not the only expanding or transformed culture of the early modern era. African religious ideas and practices, for example, accompanied slaves to the Americas. Common African forms of religious revelation divination, dream interpretation, visions, spirit possession, found a place in the Africanized versions of Christianity that emerged in the New World. Europeans frequently perceived these practices as evidence of sorcery, witchcraft, or even devil worshipping and tried to suppress them. Nonetheless, syncretic blended religions such as Voodoo in Haiti and Centuri in Cuba and Candomblé and Bukamba in Brazil persisted. They derived from various West African traditions and featured drumming, ritual dancing, animal sacrifice, and spirit possession. Over time, they incorporated Christian beliefs and practices such as church attendance, the search for salvation, and the use of candles and crucifixes, and often identified their various spirits or deities with Catholic saints. Check one more time how many pages I got. Holy crap. I may not be able to make it through all this. It doesn't look like that much when you. Yeah, that's crap. 59 to 77. <sighs> that's like 20 pages. Should I do it? Uh, I don't really want to do it. It'd be a one hour that I would stop. If I did stop. Enter the Rocket Mortgage Super Bowl Square sweepstakes. We're giving away $50,000 so yeah, every score change touchdown. Field goals, even extra points, 50 Gs. Plus, two grand prize winners will win a half million dollars that could be used toward their dream yep, home. Exactly Enter for free at rocketmortgagesquares.com. Rocket Mortgage, official mortgage for to get sponsor to 60 of so Super stop Bowl it. 54. No purchase necessary. Except Alabama, Nebraska, Mississippi, and January 30th. Licensed all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. The NFL is not sponsored promotion in any way. Cross mountain ranges. Split cells. Command the tools of tomorrow. We are a team of a million unique and